Washington and Jackson County, as well as a board certified behavior analyst. Tell us what training or experience qualifies you for that position, ma'am. Um, I've been working with children with um, sexual trauma and other mental health conditions for approximately 16 and a half years uh, and working in multiple family situations with the department and other self-referrals. Did you, as in your official capacity, ma'am, did you have an opportunity to uh, meet a little boy by the name of A.J. Hutto or Andrew Jordan Hutto? I have. Did you begin counseling with him after August of last year? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, when he testified in court on Tuesday, you were the lady that were there that was there, um, seated next to him. Yes. Okay. I want to show you what is marked as state exhibit. Yes, I do. How is it that 2A uh, came into existence and can you give us a date of when this was drawn? And before we do that, 2B is just a copy of that, is that right? That's right. Without your uh, handwritten notes on 2A? That's correct. Okay. So when, when did this document come into existence and how did it come into existence? On January 24th, on January 24th, I was seeing AJ during a therapy session, and AJ and I were reading a book um, termed Brave Bart, and it's about getting over being frightened or scared. Um, and I asked him, could he tell me of a time he had been scared? And he shook his head no and I was not able to get him to talk that much that day. And I asked him would he be willing to draw a picture of a time he was scared. And I offered him a piece of construction paper and a box of crayons and he began drawing and he completed that picture for me. Now, I don't want you to uh, tell us what he said, but was he able to then tell you or talk about it a after he drew it, ma'am? Um, let me ask at this point before I say anything about AJ, could I ask that the court order me to speak on behalf since I don't have a release from him or family on his yes, comments? You are, you are ordered by the court to answer the attorney's questions. Okay. Um, AJ did answer when I asked what was in the picture. Okay. He would give me comments about that and I wrote those on the picture itself. All right. But the white copy that we have, that, that doesn't have your comments on it. Who wrote those other words in there in the big letters on there? Those are AJ's handwriting. And the date that this was actually drawn out and, and that he wrote on there, ma'am? That was January 24th. Of, of this year? Of this year. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Any from the defense? Uh, no, sir. I don't have any questions. Okay. Horsby, you may step down. Good morning. Would Good you morning. introduce yourself to the jury? My name is Dr. Andrea Minyard. I'm the chief medical examiner for District 1 and then the interim chief medical examiner for District 14. District 1, what does that include then? District 1 is uh, Okaloosa, Walton, Santa Rosa, and Escambia counties. And District 14 <laughs> includes uh, Bay, Washington, Jackson, Holmes, Calhoun, and Gulf. Is that correct? That's correct. As the interim medical examiner, well, well, first of all, let's go back. As the medical examiner for the First Circuit, what are your official duties, ma'am? I determine the cause and manner of death in people who die according to Florida Statutes 406. As interim medical examiner for the 14th Circuit, which includes Holmes County, what are your duties? Same. And to come and testify on behalf of Dr. Siebert as well. Would you tell us about your education and your experience that qualifies you for this position, Dr. Minion? Yes, I went to medical school in Louisville, Kentucky. I graduated in 1992. I then did a five-year pathology residency, also in Louisville. Finished in 1998 
then I did a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology in Dayton, Ohio, finished in 1999, and have been practicing since. I'm also board certified by the American Board of Pathology in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. Would you go through those, each one of those, ma'am, and tell us what the differences are? Anatomic pathology is the study of the body. Clinical pathology is the study of what goes on in the body. And the forensic pathology is the study of human death and disease as it relates to a rule uh, set by society. Have you previously, t well, can you give us an idea in your career how many autopsies you've actually performed? Just ballpark. Well, since 1998, I have done about anywhere from 250 to 450 autopsies per year. Have you testified as an expert in the field of analytical, clinical, as well as forensic pathology? I've testified only in the field of forensic pathology, which is a subspecialty of the larger term pathology. This time I would tend to the witness as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. I don't have any questions. Okay, and with those answers, you may proceed. Dr. Minyard, have you had an opportunity to review the autopsy file, the official autopsy file of Adriana Hutto? Yes. In addition to that, what other documents or information have you reviewed before testifying today? <laughs> I reviewed the materials in the file. I also reviewed Holmes County Sheriff's Department uh, report. I have interviewed a statement letter by Dr. Willie. I reviewed the pictures of the autopsy, also pictures of the scene, the, the crime scene, which is the scene of the death. And um, I reviewed taped interviews with A.J. Hudo and Alan Michael, and I'm not sure, I think it's Alan Michael Carnley. Um, Do you, have you had an opportunity to review a deposition of Dr. Willie? Uh, yes, Dr. Willie's deposition as well. Now, uh, as part of the Holmes County investigative report, did you also review photographs of the scene? And by that, I mean photographs of the swimming pool where, the, where this took place. Yes. Dr. Menyard, who actually performed the autopsy of Adriana Hutto? Dr. Sieber did. Would you tell us uh, what is entailed when we talk about performing an autopsy on an individual? An autopsy is a post-mortem examination. It includes not just the study that I do in the morgue, but also all of the investigative findings as well as even some findings afterwards. For example, I turn in tests that will determine blood levels of certain drugs. So all of that together constitutes a postmortem examination or an autopsy. Actually, in the morgue, what I do is I do a why, well, first of all, we document with pictures, we document with notes, and then finally, we document the autopsy with this uh, protocol. So we will document the body as it comes in. In other words, looking at medical therapy, hair color, eye color, any injuries visible externally, any clothing. Then we will remove the clothing, clean the body, and redocument looking for injuries. And then we do an internal examination with a Y incision carried through the chest and down to the pelvis, looking at the internal organs for any, any signs of trauma or disease. And then we'll look inside the brain, look inside the head at the brain by doing an, an incision on the scalp and opening the head. Okay. After all of this is um, completed, you say you do the uh, report there? Yes, it's all put together in a report. Dr. Siebert performed this autopsy on what date and where, ma'am? He performed the autopsy on August 10th, 2007 at 10 a.m and I assume it was at his office. Would you tell us about the injuries that are documented in the report as well as the injuries that you were able to observe from the photographs contained in the official autopsy file? 
Yes, there are contusions, which are bruises, and abrasions, which are scrapes of the skin on the head and face. There are small petechial hemorrhages, which are tiny little dot hemorrhages of the eyes. There are scrapes of the lower lip. There are bruises of the chest and the lower legs. And there's a small abrasion to the uh, vaginal opening. Have you, now were a number of photographs made in this, uh, uh, of this child at autopsy, ma'am? Yes. Have you selected, have you went through and selected uh, a limited number to help explain some of the entries that you would like to discuss today? What yes. What you've been talking about? All right. May the witness step down, Judge? Yes. Sure. Ma'am, if you would step over here. Members of the jury, do you think if we turned off a row or two of lights it might help with the glare? Would you like for us to try that? All right, let's try that, Mr. Rob. Oh, that's better. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, Doctor. What do we see in this photograph, Dr. Minion? We see a picture of Adriana Hutto with a number on her chest that would be indicative of the autopsy number. Now, you've indicated that there were a number of uh, contusions and abrasions that was located on this child. Would you describe the ones that are visible in this photograph? The ones that I think are important to this uh, hearing today are, this, are the, the injuries on the face. These are bruises on the face, and you can see that they're very discolored, dark red, and very large. Um, the reason, I'm not exactly sure why her mouth is misshaped here with the lip coming down. I don't believe that to be due to an injury. I think it's more likely due to the fact that she had, uh, at one point, a breathing tube in her mouth. And um, sometimes when you, when you have a breathing tube in your mouth after you die, your lip sort of stays in that same shape. All right. Now, these bruises there on the forehead that you've been discussing with us, uh, can you tell us, based on your training and experience, anything about, uh, and, and from the review of the materials, any significance of these bruises to, uh, well, let's, let's go through the others and then we'll come back to them. You have some other photographs? Yes, I do. This is a closer up view of Adriana's face showing the bruising. You can also see some dried fluid here from the nose and from the mouth. Um, the pictures that I usually pick out to show are after these uh, fluids have been cleaned off, but this, was, this is what we have today. So these are just postmortem fluids, a little bit of leakage from the nose, a little bit of leakage from the mouth, some dry fluid over here. And again, these very prominent, discolored, very large bruises. And you'll notice that they are on different sides of her forehead. Her forehead is not a flat piece of countertop. Her forehead is rounded. And these bruises are on different planes of that rounded head. Is that, is that significant? <clears throat> yes, it is significant. When we look at children's bruises, when they fall on their foreheads, and they do, they fall on their foreheads t at times, they'll have a bruise on one, at, on one plane, and by plane I mean, uh, imagine this piece of my skin being part of a straight sheet of paper going out this way and going out this way. The bruise will be right here because that's the surface that hits the floor or the countertop or the corner of the table or what have you. So you'll have the bruise on one aspect of the head. When you have bruises that go around on both sides of the head, that's, more, that's a little more difficult to explain away as an accidental type of injury or accidental fall. Then you have another photograph. This is a photograph of the back of the head. 
and they're they're showing the the picture of the head and then this is the flap of skin that comes back off the head it's peeled away from the bone and this is a ruler and someone's hand is holding up the ruler to show how large these bruises are which are located underneath her scalp underneath her hair next to the bone and the skin also you can see the same bruises here these bruises would match up to these bruises if you replaced the skin back so, so we're talking about two major areas of bruising here not four now these major areas of bruising again are on different planes of a round head if it were an accidental bruise one where a child falls you might have one but you wouldn't have both of these because both of these surface areas are not hitting the um, floor or the countertop at the same time it's just one one surface would hit can you tell us what would cause these this type of bruising uh, or the amount of force necessary to cause a bruise like that well it's impossible to tell what kind of force would be used there are no studies but you've hit yourself before I can imagine I know I've bonked myself pretty good before and it doesn't take a whole lot of force but it takes a, a noticeable usually it takes a noticeable injury to make a bruise unless you're just prone to bruising easily in which case it may not take as much of an injury to cause a bruise and and there's no way of looking at this right here and I, I suppose and actually say what actually caused this bruise these two bruises here no there's no way I can tell what causes a bruise there's bruises can leave behind a pattern um, but the injuries here while they are in in consistent with a, a pattern that I believe there I can't say for sure that that's what caused them the ones on the back of the head they don't have a pattern just the ones on the forehead sort of have a pattern so the ones on the back of the head, I couldn't tell you. Now, they look consistent with just the head being uh, forcefully hit against a surface. Now, uh, we'll, we, we'll come back to these in just a moment, ma'am, but there were some other injuries that were noted uh, on Adriana. Yes. Could you discuss those with us? Yes, the dot hemorrhage in the eye. I did not want to show a picture of that because as far as my testimony today I'm not even considering that in injury because it can be caused by, by many different types of things if you uh, vomit really violently you can get little hemorrhages in your eye if you cough violently you can get these I would imagine if you're having CPR with chest compressions that you could get these uh, tiny hemorrhages in your eye so I don't know what caused those hemorrhages in her eye so I felt it was best not to dwell on those injuries of the eye she also had some bruising on her legs well what kid who's seven years old doesn't have bruising on the legs so as far as our purpose here is concerned I didn't want to show you bruises on the legs that could have been caused by her just falling accidentally or running into things there's also a small scrape on the opening of her vagina now this would be a a big red flag were it not for the possibility that this scrape may have been caused by insertion of a catheter a catheter is something that a tube that they'll put into the urinary bladder um, to decompress the bladder in cases of trauma and apparently there was a an attempt or several attempts made at inserting the catheter so I'm not even going to suggest that that was an inflicted injury a maliciously inflicted injury so I just am going to not show a picture of it ma'am uh, based on your uh, training and experience and based on your review of the file and the photographs and the other documents that you've talked about here today do you have an opinion as to the cause of death in this case yes well, what is that opinion I agree with Dr. Siebert's opinion that the cause of death is drowning. Okay. Do you have an opinion as to the manner of death? Yes. What is that manner? I agree to Dr. Siebert's finding, with Dr. Siebert's finding, as to manner of death being homicide. Would you tell us why you believe this to be a homicide? 
I believe this to be a homicide because I reviewed these pictures, the entire autopsy file, and seen photographs and witness statements. I see these injuries as not being explained properly by anyone, including caretaker or emergency medical technician. These are injuries that would need to be explained for me to understand why and how they got there. Since I don't have an explanation like that, I believe that this child was in a struggle and that a caretaker or whomever um, inflicted these bruises. I also believe and know for a fact that the child was found submerged in the swimming pool. There is a, in my opinion, a credible witness which um, describes how the decedent came to be in the swimming pool. And based on the statements of the witnesses, the circumstances of the investigation, and the autopsy, I believe this to be a homicide. The I believe those are my questions at this point, Judge. You will tend to the witness. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you need for her to remain standing? Okay, doctor, you may take your seat back. Dr. Menion, you said you had the, uh, the statement of a credible witness to support a conclusion that this uh, death occurred via homicide. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is that credible witness A.J. Hutto? Yes, sir. Nothing further. Any additional questions from the state? Dr. to review uh, the video statements given by A.J. Hutto? Yes. Right. If we took A.J. Hutto completely out of the question, what would be your opinion as to the manner of death penalty? I would still rule this a homicide based on the fact that I have substantial unexplained injuries in a child who is simply found in a pool. In my opinion, when I have unexplained injuries, that usually means violent struggle. Any objections to Dr. Minyard uh, being allowed to return to uh, her work? 